Today we find ourselves in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. Feel free to follow along up on the screen or in your Bibles in front of you. Let's hear what God has to say to us this morning. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of all acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we recognize that there is nothing that we can add to salvation. There's not a thing that we can do. There's not a a prayer that we can pray that can add some way to the grace that we find in Christ. And so we set our hope on the living God. And God, we recognize that out of that flows a desire to thirst after you, a desire to know you more and more, God. And that takes discipline. That takes work, Lord. And so I pray this morning that we would be encouraged in that walk. I pray that that Pastor Trent would be able to, to preach a message that is bold, God, that is convicting, that hits at those parts in our heart that we would rather not show on a Sunday morning. But God, we recognize that your spirit sees all of it, and so we are foolish if we don't give it over to you. And so this morning, we lay everything at your feet, and we say, do what you want with us, Lord, because we are yours. Train us, Lord, train us. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I continue to see more and more of our up north family coming back down to Naples. It's great to see all of you. Welcome. Those of you who are just returning and just returning the last few weeks. Um, I wanted to share with you, uh, until just a couple of years ago, a big, uh, a big part of my life was training for marathons. Uh, this was something that I found to be fun. For those of you who haven't done it, that might not make much sense. But uh, I found it to be quite enjoyable and it fed into some aspects of my personality and temperament that were, uh, that I just thrived on this. And, and when I was training for marathons, like, like anybody who's training for a marathon who wants to be successful, however they define it, uh, it requires a great deal of planning and intentionality. So my marathon training plans were usually looking about 20 weeks out and I knew exactly what I was gonna be doing every single day for the next few weeks and a very clear picture of what I was going to be doing all the way out 20 weeks until the actual race. And, and success in a marathon requires that kind of planning and it requires that you actually work that plan and stick to it until you get to the end. And in order to do that, it takes a lot of time just to make the plan. And you got to consult books or coaches and other running friends, and you're looking at websites, you're trying to figure out, how do I put all of this together to get the best possible outcome on the other side of this training? And then you have to look at your own life calendar and say, all right, here's the plan that I've got, but is this actually going to work in terms of what's going on in our family and what's happening with, with work over the next few months? And can this, is this actually possible? And you have to sort all of this stuff out. It's, it takes a great deal of effort. And then if you're really committed, which I wasn't, you pay attention to your nutrition. And 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 you're careful to eat certain things and not eat other things. And and, and it it shapes everything about the way you, it shapes everything about your life. Now, why, why is this, why so much intentionality? Why so much planning? Why so much effort put into this? Well, because it's a 26.2 mile race. And if you just show up on race day and hope everything works out fine, you're going to hate your life. And so you have to be prepared for this. You have to develop. You have to train for this. You need to be ready because it's a long race. You can show up and run a sprint. Most, Most of us could show up and run a sprint without a great deal of planning in advance. 
But if you're going to run an endurance event, you need to be prepared for it. And what we find when we come to the scripture is that more often Christianity is compared to an endurance event than it is a sprint. And if we're going to make it the distance successfully and in a way that, that, that we actually are, are happy along the way, we've got joy and, and we're making an impact and, and we're, we're persevering in ministry, whatever that looks like for us, if we're going to make it to the end, it also requires some intentionality, requires some planning. In fact, Paul says explicitly here, it requires training. Do you have a training plan for godliness? Because he says in this text that we just read, train yourself for godliness. And the only training I've ever done requires a plan. Maybe you've done other kinds of training. I don't know. But I wonder, do you have a training plan for godliness? Something that you're intentional about. These are the things I'm working on. Here's how I'm going about it. This is... If you're anything like me, you might discover that your training plans for physical fitness goals and sports and so on are far superior to your training plan for godliness. In fact, many of us go about our training in godliness in a very haphazard way at best, and it's based primarily on what do I feel like, or more likely, what do I not feel like doing today? In fact, I found a great video that I think is a helpful picture of what some of our training plans for godliness look like. Um, it features someone named Cinderblock the Cat. Take a look at a picture of our spiritual training here for godliness. Are you working out? Oh, good girl. <laughs> That's good work. <laughs> Does that, does that accurately represent your own efforts at training for godliness? I'm devoted to the word. I'm devoted to prayer. I'm striving after Jesus. I'm afraid for too many of us. That's an accurate reflection of our efforts at godliness. Now, who puts a cat on a treadmill in water? I don't know. Apparently, you go to school and learn that, and it becomes smart along the way. I don't know. But that's often what our training plans look like, our efforts at godliness. Well, not anymore. By God's grace, in obedience to the Scripture, by the grace of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, and for the sake of the nations to know Christ, we're going to train ourselves for godliness because it's what the book says. And the book says this because it's for our good and it's for our joy and it's for the spread of the good name of Jesus all across the earth. Now, he already showed us in the text we looked at last week that, that godliness doesn't come from various forms of asceticism, whether it's rejecting certain foods or rejecting marriage and so on. That's not where godliness comes from. The mystery or the secret of godliness we saw at the end of chapter 3 is Christ. He's the one who was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. He is the secret to godliness. And it's through faith in him that we also become like him. And I want to show you how that works. So we're going to look at four headings today. The need for training yourself for godliness. And we'll start there. The need for training yourself in godliness. Verse 6. He says to Timothy, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. If you put these things before the brothers, and what's he talking about here? At the very least, he's talking about what we just saw last week. In other words, if you warn the brothers about the deceptive teachings that are out there that have demonic influences, if you remind them of a good theology of creation, that God's made everything good and to be enjoyed by his people with thanksgiving, you remind them of these things, you'd be a good servant of Christ Jesus. But that's not the only things that Timothy's to put in front of the people as a good servant. We can go back and work our way through the letter. All of the things that Paul has talked about in this need to be set before the people of God. We saw he talked about the ministry of Christ, who's the savior of sinners. We need to put the message of salvation before sinners. We need to put the message about a right understanding of God's law in the life of a believer in front of the people. 
We need to talk about the appropriate qualifications for church leadership and how the church is to be ordered and structured. These are all the sorts of things that need to be put in front of God's people. A good servant of Jesus, which is what we all would want to be called, I think, means putting the truth of God's word in front of people so they can see it, embrace it, we hope, and even become more like him as a result of it. But it's not enough for the good servant to put these things in front of the brothers. The text says, if he does this, he says, you will be a good servant being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you followed. Verse six, being trained. The, the Greek word here is sometimes translated being nourished or being brought up. To be nourished by something speaks to getting nutrition for yourself. It's what our bodies need to produce healthy cells and do all the things that our body does. It requires nourishment. Well, likewise, he says, you, if you're going to be a good servant of Christ Jesus, not only need to put good nourishment in front of the people, but you yourself need to be nourished by the, what does he say? The words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you follow. These are the things that need to nourish the soul of the servant of God. But it's not enough that you nourish your soul by the truth of the word and the good doctrine that you followed. He says, he goes on and says, that you have followed. Timothy's putting these things in front of the people, truth. He's being nourished on the truth himself continually. But he's also following these things. He's actually, he's actually living them out on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the, the truth of God's word. So a healthy Christian, a healthy servant of Jesus is being nourished on the words of the faith and the good doctrine. They're putting it into practice themselves. They're living it out on a day-to-day -day basis and they're setting it in front of others so that together we might all grow up into maturity in Jesus. Or in other words, we might all become godly. This is what a good servant of Christ Jesus does. Uh, there was a Puritan mother who wrote a letter that people found uh, to his son who was off at college, and she emphasizes this very thing, and I love how she puts it. Listen to what she writes. She said, in some proportion it is with the soul as with the body, there must be a good diet. We must feed upon the word of God, which when we have done, we must not let it lie idle, but we must be diligent in the exercising of what we know. And the more we practice, the more we shall know. This is what a healthy Christian life, this is what a person being trained in the faith is doing. They're, they're nourishing themselves on the truth of God's word, on the good teaching. They're practicing it, and the more they practice it, the more they're knowing it, the more they're being nourished by it. If we're only consuming and we're never living out actually what we are learning, we actually will become quite unhealthy spiritually. But it's the exercising, the working out of the truths that we know that help to make us healthy Christians. So we have this need for training in godliness. We've been talking in our Thursday men, morning men's group about how as the leaders of our families, we can't pass on to our families what we don't have ourselves. If we want to pass on godliness to them, we need to be pursuing godliness ourselves. Uh, we can't give them what we don't have. We don't, can't give them a vibrant relationship with Jesus unless we know what that looks like and we're experiencing it for ourselves. So Timothy, as a good servant, needs to be one who's trained in godliness because he's a minister. And of course, ministers should be trained in godliness and help others to grow in godliness. But you're ministers too. Some of you serve as small group leaders. You can't pass on to your small group what you're not growing in and, and, growing, and learning yourself. Some of you are Sunday school teachers. Some of you are parents called to shepherd those in your home. Others of you are grandparents called to invest in the lives of your grandkids. The fact of the matter is this is something that's training ourselves for godliness, not only that we might be godly, but so that we can help others also, is an important central part of the Christian life. So that's the need for godliness. Secondly, we see the command to train yourself for godliness. Verse 6. He puts it negatively first, then he puts it positively. First of all, he says, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Uh, this was referred to already back in chapter 1, verse 4. The false teachers had come into Ephesus. They were telling people, you know, you really need the secret to, to mysteryness and it's, it, uh, to, to godliness. It's found in these Jewish myths, these extra biblical writings. Um, and people have been doing that for a very long time. 
that what you really need if you're going to advance in the, in the Christian life is something that's found outside of this book. And what, what Paul says to Timothy is, don't have anything to do with that stuff. Set your focus here. Impart these things to the people because this is where growth comes from. The words of the faith, the good teaching that you've followed. Uh, be on your guard, brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, every new book that comes out and every website that's published doesn't have a spiritual nutrition value label on the front. But if it did, you would discover that there's a lot of drivel out there, the equivalent of spiritual Twinkies that will not help you in your growth and training in godliness. So stay close to the Word. And the resources that we try to distribute here, we try to make sure to have good spiritual values so that you can grow in the things that matter, the things that actually lead to godliness. So like good athletes, we want to cut out of our diet everything that's, that's not helping us grow healthy and be, be fit spiritually. And instead, we read, train yourself for godliness. Rather, train yourself for godliness. This is something that's obviously... He intends for us to do something. Just to point out the obvious, it's a command, right? Train yourself for godliness. Now, he never says save yourself. Because you can't save yourself, right? We all need Jesus to save us. But in light of the salvation that Jesus has accomplished and that he gives to all freely who will receive it by faith, in light of that salvation, he says, now train yourself for godliness. This is something you, you are expected to be an active participant in. You're responsible for your training in godliness. If you're not spiritually fit and healthy, well, you need to do something about it. Paul says, do this, train yourself. For godliness, and my aim today, of course, is to help give you some practical ways to do that. But train yourself for godliness. But what is godliness anyway? It's a word we throw around a lot. We assume we know what it means. We would, in, in short, we might define godliness this way, that godliness is being like God. And that's, there's actually some truth to that. It's not a bad short definition. But the actual root word for godliness in, in Greek has more to it, and I want you to see it because I think it's helpful to get a fuller orbed picture of biblical godliness. Here's how a New Testament scholar George Knight and the founding pastor of this church describes it in his commentary. He says, this word, godliness, and others from the same root refer to awe and reverence, which imply a worship that befits awe and a life of active obedience that befits reverence. So a person who is godly has this sense of awe and reverence in the presence of God that not only shapes their worship, but it shapes the way they do everything in their life. In other words, a godly person is eminently aware of the presence of God all the time. In worship, but then all of life becomes worship for them because they realize that as they wake and as they go to bed and everything in between, they're living before the eyes of the holy God. And so they want every single part of their life to reflect the awe and the reverence that they have for him and in their heart. So how do we become increasingly godly? How do we train ourselves to have a, an, an, uh, an ever-increasing awareness the presence and the majesty and the glory and the goodness of God. Well, the Bible gives us a number of means that are called means of grace. And they're quite familiar to you. Let me just share a few of them with you. You can train yourself for godliness by the word. Train yourself for godliness by the word. In other words, this, this book that we look at every week, that you have probably multiple copies of at your house. Open it up and read it. And read it like a person looking for food who's hungry. Read it for, like a person who's, who's looking for nourishment because that's what it is. Read it like a starving person because that's what you are. And let him feed you by the ministry of his spirit working through the word. We're coming to the end of 2019. We're heading into 2020. That's a time when a lot of people often think about I should do a Bible reading plan this year. 
which is a great thing. It's a way of being intentional. That might be a great part of your training plan for godliness. I'm going to be in the Word every day or on these days, at these times, this kind of intentionality. It's a great thing. But let me encourage you, you don't have to wait till 2020 to start. You can actually get a Bible reading plan today. And in fact, let me give you a little secret. Get a 2020 Bible reading plan today and start it now. Here's what will happen. You're going to miss a few days between now and January 1st, 2020. And whereas you might be discouraged if you did that when you started in January, now when January 1st rolls around, even if you miss a few days, you're going to be well into February in your Bible reading plan. And instead of being discouraged, you're going to feel pretty good about yourself. Because look how far ahead I am in my Bible reading plan. You don't have to do it that way, but I'd encourage you to do it that way. You're going to feel great about it. The point is not how much you read every day. The point is that you're in the Word and that you're reading it as a person looking for nourishment because that's what you are. And the, one of the ways to help get nourishment out of the Word is to not only to read it, but to, to meditate on it or reflect on it. So a couple of questions that may help you to meditate on the Word would be things like this. All right, I just read this passage. Is there any particular command here that I need to obey? Or as I read this passage, is there any sin that's been highlighted in my life that I need to confess and, and turn away from? Or was there a promise or a truth in this scripture that I need to be intentional to believe and, and to make sure that this truth is shaping my life more than the lie that I've been believing? You see, just a little bit of that and you'll discover that the, the, the riches and the nourishment of the word began to well up, fill your soul and strengthen you and you increasingly become more in awe, more reverent, aware of God all the time and desiring to please him in every part of your life. Train yourself by the word. Don't neglect it. He's given it to you for your good and growth. Secondly, train yourself by prayer. I, I just want to go back to the very beginning on prayer. There's some of you here, you've never prayed before. So let me just start at the beginning and maybe it'll be helpful for those of you who've, who've been praying a long time. Prayer is, is communicating with God. That communication is two-way. God primarily speaks to us through his word, and we speak back to him through our words. And if you've, if you've not prayed before, a great model you can follow is the Lord's Prayer that we prayed already this morning in our service. Or another method that a lot of people have used is called the Acts model of prayer. And the word Acts is an acrostic, and it stands for four things. The A stands for adoration. It's good to come into prayer by praising God. Just tell him about how much you appreciate who he is. And if you don't know what you appreciate about him, there's a book here in the Bible called Psalms. It's the biggest one in the middle. Just start reading through there and you'll begin to discover some things that you can praise God for and adore him for. And you'll find as you adore him in prayer and as you're reading the scripture, that sense of awe and reverence is going to grow in your heart. The C in Acts stands for confession. Even as we adore God and we praise him for who he is, we become increasingly aware of how we fall short. And so when we pray, it's appropriate for us to say to God, I'm sorry for this, that I've had this attitude, that I did that action, that I've said these words. This is not, this is not right. I confess it. Please forgive me. I want to turn away from it, put it away. That's confession. It's appropriate for you to do that. The T stands for thanksgiving. We all know what this means. We give thanks to God for his blessings. First and foremost, thank him for Jesus Christ who's taken away your sins, reconciled you to God so that you can pray to him and call him your father. But every blessing in your life has come from him and you can thank him for them and you should in your time of prayer. You don't have to thank him for all of them every time, but you know what I'm saying. And then the S in Acts stands for supplication. Supplication is not a super helpful word for most of us, but it makes the acrostic work, so we use it. Supplication. And supplication is just another way of saying requests. What are, the, what are the things on your heart? What do you desire to see God do in your life? In the world you're living in, in your family, in your church, in your nation, what do you desire him to do? He says, come and ask me. And ask me in the name of Jesus. I'm going to listen to what you have to say. And I'm going to respond and give you what's good. As we do this, God he, he begins to shape us in godliness. Train yourself by the word, train yourself in prayer, and then thirdly, train yourself by Christian fellowship. And this is one of the most neglected of the means 
of grace that God has given us, and that is the local fellowship of believers. We need one another to help each other grow in godliness. You see, it's as we live in close relationships with other sinners that we become aware just how desperately needy we are of grace from God. And as we have to learn to ask forgiveness when we've hurt others, and as we have to learn how to extend forgiveness when we've been hurt, God uses that almost as much or more than anything else to help us grow in godliness, to become increasingly like him. So train yourself by the word, train yourself by prayer, train yourself in Christian fellowship. Let's encourage one another, the scripture says, and even more as we see the day approaching to keep growing in our pursuit of Jesus. So that's the, we've seen the need for godliness. We've seen the command to train yourself for godliness. Now let's look at the promise that's attached to this command. He says in verse eight, for while bodily training is of some value, Godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. There are a couple things that need to be said. The first is this. Paul says bodily training is of some value. He's not down on bodily training. Some people are for spiritual reasons. But actually the way Paul describes the body is he says it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body's the only vehicle you have in which to serve God on this earth. If it's out of order and it's not functioning and it's not capable of working because you've been mistreating it, neglecting it, not caring for it rightly, it's gonna limit your ability to participate in this work of helping train others for godliness. And what you find as you look at the, the, the map is that a lot of the states that have paid the least attention to the body are actually the ones that are in the Bible belt with the most professing Christians in them. Paul says, bodily training is of some value. Don't, don't neglect this temple that you have. Take care of it. But at the same time, he says, comparatively, it's only of some value. And there are some folks today who need to hear that who've got so much of their life is oriented around their health and their diet and their physical fitness or their sports and activities that it pushes out everything else in their life. And this is especially true for the up and coming generations. There was a survey done of the, the uh, millennials and this is what they found. 79% of them said family was important in their lives, followed by health and wellness at 53%, friends at 39%, spirituality at 31%, and career at 27%. In other words, it's the flip upside down of what Paul says when it comes to spirituality and physical health. He says bodily training is of some value, but training in godliness is a value for all things. Not only now, but in the future. Now, if I were to ask you, survey you in this room, and, and those of you who identify as Christians, I'd say, which is more important to you, your physical health and your bodily training or your training in godliness, your spirituality? you would probably say, almost to a person, my spiritual life, my spiritual health, way more important than my physical health. But then if we were to get out your checkbook register, and we were to get out your daily planner for the last year, and we were to look at, at how your investment in your physical health compares to your investment in your soul's health, would we discover that in fact, yes, Godliness is your chief concern. Or might we discover that maybe in the pursuit of bodily training, however you understand it, it's actually crowded out the pursuit of godliness. I think that wouldn't be unusual for us to discover that actually we've invested a whole lot more, or we are investing a whole lot more in our physical health than our spiritual health. And let me just encourage you to turn that around. Paul's not down and I'm not down on sports or physical training or, or health. By no means, it's the temple. It needs to be taken care of. Get the health care that you need when you need it. And we need a lot. According to 2018 figures, $3.65 trillion worth of health care. Maybe we don't need all of that. 
But how much are you investing in the care of your soul and in your training for godliness? How much time are you devoting to thinking about that the way that you're thinking about your health issues and challenges or about whatever physical goals you've set for yourself? In regards to this verse, uh, Phil Riken says, he says, almost certainly the apostle was taking a swipe at the sports craze in Ephesus. The Ephesians spent a great deal of time and money training young athletes to perform at pagan festivals. Well, it's a good thing we've learned not to do that these days, right? If he said that to the people in Ephesus, what might he say to us parents and our sports craze, particularly with our youth? I think sports are important. I play them. I play a lot of them, actually, and so does our family. But if our sports and our pursuit of them are crowding out the training in godliness that's so important for ourselves and our kids, we need to change something. It's not enough for you just to hear this. You actually need to do something about it. That's what repentance is. It's saying, I've been out of order here. My life's been out of whack. I need to get back on the straight and narrow and get my life back into alignment and get my priorities back where they belong. And why does he say this? Why does he say that bodily training is of some value, but training in godliness is of value in every way? Well, because of the comparative uh, longevity of the, the benefits of each. He says, godliness, training in godliness holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. When you invest yourself in your physical health and, 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 and you're consumed by that and you diet and, and sports and kids sports and so on, your whole life is consumed with those things. You just need to know that at the end of the day, when your body goes in the grave or your kids go into the grave, that all of that comes to nothing. The value of it's over. It's got value in life. Physical activity and so on is good for our mental health, even our spiritual health and, and, and certainly our physical health. But... But just know that when you die, it's done. But he says, not so with godliness. He says, what you invest into the health of your own soul, what you invest into your training in godliness, that doesn't stop just because you're dead. The value of that transfers over into the life to come. How does this work exactly? I don't know for sure. But I know this, I know that in this life, those who are pursuing godliness, I know that the scripture says that those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. It's got value in this life to seek him. You might not have everything that you ever wanted, but you lack no good thing if he's your chief pursuit in this world. I know that Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You may not get everything that you want, but you'll get everything that he intends for you to have and it'll be good. It's got value in this life. It doesn't mean that life's going to be easy, that you won't experience hardships and heartbreak and, 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 and the, the realities of life in a, in a broken world. But what it does mean is that through the midst of it, you will have a life with God that brings you joy that the circumstances around you can't touch. That's the promise for you who are pursuing God in this world. The promise is abundant life, eternal life. The reality of heaven begins to make its way into your world before you even die. That's the promise of godliness for this world. And after you die, he says, it continues. Again, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but I, what I take it to mean is that the time you invest in reading God's word and applying it to your life, that's not lost just because you're dead. But somehow that investment is going to carry on into eternity. And when you bow down and hit your knees and you seek his face in prayer, th that prayer is going to have value now, but it doesn't end just because you die. But that, the value of that prayer is going to continue on into eternity. And the other ways that you're intentionally pursuing the Lord and disciplining yourself for godliness, all of those things are going to have an eternal, lasting value. So taking care of your physical body is a great short-term investment, not to be neglected. But make sure that you're investing long-term. Investing in your soul's health. Training yourself for godliness in the ways that he describes in this passage. I, I had some time this summer at a... Um, 
at a retreat that was a silent retreat for 10 days, no internet, no distraction of any sort. You get a lot of time to think in a place like that. And I got thinking about my own life and how much time I spent in my life training myself physically, mostly for different sports that I've been interested in over the years. And, and, I, and, I, and I just got to thinking, man, when I show up before the Lord on that last day, how much is this stuff going to matter that I've poured so much time and energy into? You know, if, if when you stand before God on that last day, you're going to have to play a singles tennis match with St. Peter, then it makes a lot of sense to practice a lot. Or if it's going to be a, a drive, chip, and putt competition on the last day, then by all means, spend all your available time out on the practice range. Or if he's going to quiz you on your knowledge of the latest sports stats for every sport out there and every team, then devote yourself to the study of these things. But that's not what he says is coming on the last day. And so we would be wise to enjoy those good gifts of sports and so on that God gives us, but to make sure that we're investing ourselves in something that's going to have an impact for eternity that's going to last. And, and the scripture tells us that's godliness, the pursuit of him. What's the motivation for this kind of single-minded life, this desire for godliness and and training yourself for God. And as he gives it to us in verse 10, he says, for to this end we toil and strive because we've set our hope on the living God who's the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. The end that Paul is toiling and laboring after is this training in godliness for himself, but also for others. He uses these exact same words in Colossians 1 where he says that he is toiling and striving to present everyone mature in Christ on the last day. It's the same thing he's saying here. I'm toiling and striving for godliness for myself and for the people that I'm ministering to because I want all of us to be presented to, to the Lord mature on that last day. And what's his motivation for striving for godliness for himself and the people he's ministering to? Is he striving so that he can be saved? No way. Paul knows that you can't strive for your salvation. You can't work for your salvation. Salvation's a gift. You receive that by faith. That's the only way you can receive it. He's not striving and toiling to keep his salvation. It's God who's accomplished his salvation. What's he, what's he toiling and striving in this way? What's driving him? What he says is what's driving him is hope. His hope, he says, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God. His hope is on the, the, the God who's alive, this, this Jesus Christ, who is the mystery of godliness, who working by his spirit, through his word, through prayer, through the people of God, actually is maturing people until they increasingly look like him. His hope is that as he puts these truths before people, that the living God is actually going to be changing people and making them godly, himself included. And this is his passion and joy to see people become godly, meaning to see people have an increasing awe and reverence for who God is in a life that then conforms to that reality. You see, when you're, when you're godly in the sense we've been describing, when your vision is captured with awe and reverence at who God is, it's not enough for you to be captured by it and to live accordingly. You want other people to be captured by him. You want to hold him up in front of people. And, and this is who God is. And this is what he's called us to. And this is what he's done for us. You want to see other people moved with awe and reverence to live lives of obedience to him because, well, because you love him because you are amazed by him, because he's opened your eyes in wonder to who he is and what he's done for you. And you want other people's eyes to be opened as well. That's what causes Paul to toil and labor and strive. That might sound like legalism to some of you. That's not legalism. Legalism is toiling and striving to earn something for yourself. Grace means receiving what God gives us freely by faith. And then as a response to what we've freely received, we hunger and thirst for righteousness. We long for him like the deer longs for the flowing streams. We want more of him. 
How will you know if you've set your hope on the living God? You will toil and strive for godliness for yourself and for others joyfully. It will be your joy to train yourself for godliness, much as it's many people's joy to train themselves for a marathon. It will be your pleasure to open his word and to get into it. Not that it's always easy, but it will be your joy to commune with him in prayer, to fellowship with his people, and to see the way that he uses these things to help you grow in your own godliness and the opportunities he gives you to help others to grow likewise so that through all of our lives, he receives glory and honor, the glory and honor he's worthy of. John puts it this way in 1 John 3, Beloved, as we are God's children now, what will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. When our hope is set on him, we will get busy and diligent at training ourselves for godliness, at purifying ourselves as he is pure. Not because we have to. Our salvation is a gift we receive freely. We do it because we want to. We want to be like him. And that's why we train ourselves for godliness. Is that your desire this morning? It'll take effort. Grace isn't opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. It'll take time. It'll take intentionality. It'll take a team. But when Jesus is your hope and you understand that he's not only your hope, but the hope for people everywhere, this will be your motivation, your drive, and your passion. Let's pray for that together. Lord, we pray that you would make us a people who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for we know that they are blessed. We pray that you would make us a people who are not satisfied with where we are currently in our godliness, but that out of the motivation of love and not of condemnation, we would pursue godliness with everything that's in us, that we would be intentional to discipline ourselves, to train for godliness, to be people of the word, people of prayer, people of Christian fellowship, and that you would be pleased to use these means, Lord, to give us a bigger vision of who you are, that our own hearts would be filled with your love and that we would be driven out of ourselves then to share that love with others. We pray that you would do this work in us for the sake of the nations and for the glory of your name. We pray it in Christ's name, amen.